Hello. Um, in the closing of the American... You can all hear me, can't you? Yeah? In the closing of the American Mind, uh, a 1985 book uh, which capitalised on the burgeoning uh, culture wars in the US and became a surprise bestseller, uh, its author, Alan Bloom, uh, identified Heidegger as the most powerful intellectual force of our times. Um, and I don't think Bloom's far wrong, to be honest. Uh, being in time which Heidegger wrote uh, in the early to mid-1920s, uh, when he was in his 30s, uh, is undoubtedly one of the works of the 20th century. Uh, although a bit like Ulysses, I think it tends to be more cited than read. But its philosophical influence, uh, its cultural mark, is indelible. Uh, it, it informs, I think, post-war Sartrean uh, existentialism. Uh, being in nothingness, Sartre's own opus, I think can be read almost as like a being in time tribute act. Uh, it inspired Herbert Marcuse, uh, a former student of Heidegger, I think, who became for a while the uh, intellectual face of the countercultural uh, left. Uh, and it also influenced uh, Hannah Arendt, who, like Marcuse, uh, was a student of Heidegger, uh, but unlike Marcuse, also uh, had an affair with Heidegger. And it formed any number of structuralisms, uh, post or otherwise. Uh, French communist uh, Louis Althusser, for instance, claimed to have half plagiarised uh, Heidegger's uh, letter on humanism, as it happens, uh, to critique what he called Marxist uh, humanism. Um, and Jack Derrida uh, spoke of the air of legitimacy which clung to Heidegger's thought uh, in the 1960s uh, in France. Uh, and its influence actually is not just felt on the left, I don't think, or indeed the left bank. Uh, it's there in the work of the godfather, or the so-called godfather of neoconservatism, uh, Leo Strauss. And it's there in uh, assorted species, I think, of environmentalism <coughs> and deep ecology too. But why has Heidegger, and being in time in particular, uh, proved so entrancing? What is it, I think, what is it about Heidegger's work uh, that has proved so uh, resonant, uh, so appealing uh, for so long? And I think the answer comes in two parts. Uh, the first, I think, is that Being in Time is a genuinely explosive work. It descales eyes, it rents veils. Uh, you cannot read it, I think, uh, and I still think about philosophy or even, even oneself and the world in, in quite the same way. Um, Heidegger is, as his introduction to Being in Time declares, carrying out nothing less than the, the, destruct the destructuring or destruction of the Western philosophical tradition. Uh, so in this respect, uh, what is Heidegger saying in Being in Time uh, that is so destructuring, so eye-opening? Uh, well, his central contention is that we've forgotten the uh, Seinsfrage, uh, the question of being. Uh, we think we know what it is to be. Uh, indeed, we think we know the nature of being. Uh, we have grand names for our own being, even. Uh, we are following Aristotle, rational animals. We are syntheses of soul and body, and so on. And as such, we think we have defined the essence of our being. Um, and we also think we know the being of the world. It is, it is nature. Um, it operates according to certain physical laws. Uh, and what's more, it's there for us to use, uh, an instrument to be used for human ends. In the later work, The Question Concerning Technology, published in 1954, Heidegger says, we treat the world around us as a standing reserve, as something to be stored up and used by us. Uh, so we think we know what it is to be. We think, we, well, you we already think we know the nature of being. Uh, we think we know how things are. Uh, we think we know what we are, in essence. And what the world is, in essence. Uh, but this is not so, argues Heidegger. Uh, all we have done is obscured the question of being, uh, forgotten the question of being. Indeed, uh, forgotten, we have forgotten the question of being. As he explains in Being and Time, um, Thanks to Christianity and the anthropology of the ancient world, we have mistaken abstractions for being, such as rational animal. We have re reified ourselves in the world. We have partitioned being up into knowing subjects and objects to be known, masters of nature and a nature to be mastered, um, rational animals and non-rational nature and so on. And we have stopped asking, why is there something rather than nothing? We have stopped being astonished at the sheer quiddity of existence, that it, that it is. Um, we've stopped posing the question of being because we think we already know the answer. Now, Heidegger's response to what he sees as our forgetting of the question of being is to construct, as he calls it, a fundamental ontology. That is an analysis of the nature of being, a portrait, if you like, of what it is 
to be, how we exist, how we come to encounter the world around us in our everydayness. And I think in this regard, being in time is an incredible achievement. Uh, you know, painfully, meticulously, uh, Heidegger describes how we exist uh, by studying our everyday being, how we are in the world. And he does so in a unique language, free of traditional philosophical terms, a language that incorporates sort of everyday phrases and everyday, well, everyday German phrases and everyday words and turns them into something almost like magically foreign. Um, and I think this is also the source of its apparent difficulty. Linguistically, it is one of the most, uh, well, it, linguistically, it's one of the most monumental achievements, I think, in, in philosophy. It's a work, if you like, of philosophical modernism. Uh, Hegel's linguistically difficult uh, to, in, in a different sense. Uh, Wittgenstein's probably elusive, but I think Heidegger, linguistically, is almost mesmerizing. Um, so how does Heidegger build a portrait of existence? Heidegger's existential analysis of being begins with this idea of Dasein, uh, that's, that's us, this, this individual being there, as he puts it, the being for whom being is an issue, uh, the being that is who cares about his being uh, and is necessarily concerned with the world around him. And what is it to be there? What is it to be Dasein, to be the being for whom being is an issue? Uh, what is it to be, effectively, this being that exists? If, if it... Heidegger's answer, he says, it is to exist always already in the world. Uh, this means that as Dasein, we come to know things, come to know the world, uh, not as an abstract subject, uh, a rational animal contemplating a world of objects apart from us. No, we come to encounter the world in terms of our dealings with it, uh, through our concernful absorption in the world. So we encounter things in terms of how we use them, uh, as instruments, or as he puts it, the ready to hand. Um, and I think this is where time enters the picture of being. Uh, that's because in our concernful absorption in the world around us, we are always working towards some end, some project. We are always projecting ourselves into the future. Moreover, the ready to hardness of the world, its sort of its instrumentalization, its, its tool-like uh, nature, is ordered according to Heidegger, uh, according to a for, for the sake of which. Um, an end, if you like. So yes, following Sartre, one knows the hammer best when, when, when one uses it to hammer. Uh, but in addition to that, unless someone's a bit sort of mentally de deranged, the hammer, the hammering is usually part of a project. Uh, we hammer in order to realise an objective, in order to, uh, to, to realise um, a project. You know, it could be just constructing a bookcase, uh, for example. So, the way in which the world acquires its significance, the, uh, the way in which the world almost acquires its meaning, uh, the way it appears as nature as such, uh, it could be soil used for crops, it could be fossilised matter being used for energy, is due to the way in which we, which we use the world around us, the way in which we encounter it as, uh, as equipment or, or, ready to, or ready to hand. Um, we experience it, we are conscious of being, that is, in terms of the use to which we put things around us. We exist in a world that is already structured, uh, that is fully instrumentalised, allotting roles and purposes to things, and indeed people, in order to meet certain ends. As Heidegger put it, in roads, streets, buildings, our concern discovers nature as having some definite direction. But Dasein, human being, is not just thrown into and immersed in a world of equipment, of the ready to hand. Uh, no, Dasein is not just being in the world, it, is also always, it also already exists in a world with others. At this point, Heidegger, I think, explicitly analyses uh, the nature of social existence, of being in the world with others. He says effectively that in being in the world with others, we exist on others' terms. Uh, we exist as, uh, as part of what he calls the they, uh, the social mass, effectively. Uh, now, the German, which is rendered as the they, is actually das Mann, uh, the pronoun one. So in being in the world with others, it's not a case of I think or I ought or I do. It's a question of one thinks, of uh, one ought or one does. It's an existence that is governed, in effect, by the norms, mores and opinions of a, an anonymous social mass represented by the impersonal pronoun one. The they, writes Heidegger, which is nothing definite and which all are, though not the sum, pre prescribes the kind of being 
of everydayness. He is saying, therefore, that this they-self, this subsumption of the individual Dasein by a general one, by an anonymous social mass, characterises our everyday being. And it's at this point, I think, that, is, that Heidegger's fundamental ontology, his analysis of existence, starts explicitly to look like a social critique. He is arguing that in our everyday existence, Dasein is not its own. Uh, it is not itself. We are not ourselves in our everyday existence. As part of society, being with others, Dasein thinks and acts in terms of the one, thinking what one ought to think, acting how one ought to act, and so on and so forth. Uh, and I think here it's, not, it, it, it's difficult to not hear uh, the echo of Nietzsche here, of Nietzsche's distaste, if you like, for mass society, uh, for mass democracy even, his distaste for the life of the herd, as he put it. Because like Nietzsche, Heidegger believes that society, modern democratic society, in which the opinion of the majority holds sway, in which the public plays an increasingly determining role, he believes that this type of society dumbs down, it cultivates an averageness. He writes, averageness prescribes what can and may be ventured, suppressing everything exceptional that thrusts itself to the fore. And further on, averageness reveals in turn an essential tendency of Dasein, which we call the levelling down of all potentialities of being. And here I think we come to the second, and to my, to my mind, the main reason why Heidegger's work has proved so entrancing uh, and so appealing for so long. And that's because he offers not just a new form of thinking, not just because, because he offers like a, a radical new uh, philosophical uh, direction. Uh, it's because he also offers, as I say, a social critique. He offers, in fact, a thoroughgoing critique of modernity. He criticises mass democratic society for tyrannising over the individual, in effect, for levelling down, for subordinating the exceptional uh, to the average. And he criticises the way in which we, as a society, tend to understand the world in terms of what he sees in, as an entirely instrumental, technological, in effect, technological reason. That is, for modern man, the world only has meaning, significance, insofar as it is subject to human societal ends. So yes, being in time is an ontology, is, is a project, as Heidegger says, a fundamental ontology, a, a study of the nature of being. Uh, but it is more than that. Uh, it is also critique. It says how we ought to be, how we ought to approach the question of being, of how we ought to be able to encounter, if you like, being in the raw, um, as it were, free of this they-self, free of this kind of public, uh, anonymized mass. Uh, free of the instrumentalizing uh, technological reasoning that seeks mastery over nature. Uh, midway through uh, Being in Time, Heidegger even says, this is not a moralizing critique. I'm not writing a moralizing critique. Uh, and I think if you feel the need to assert that you're not writing a moralizing critique, that's a surefire sign you're probably doing precisely that. So, you know, look at his criticism of this they self. Look at his criticism of, of social existence. He notes how Dasein is enthralled to what he calls idle talk, which is roughly something like received wisdom or, or common sense. Uh, or, or, he criticizes something called uh, curiosity, which I think is something like unserious kind of dilettantism. And he criticizes uh, ambiguity, which is another, uh, another prevalent mode of being in the social world, which is something akin to never really uh, thinking too hard about anything before moving on, on to the next thing. And he argues that Dasein does not encounter uh, being for itself, does not, design does not encounter uh, being um, directly without the mediating influence, if you like, of this they-self. Uh, it simply accepts the public interpretation of things. As Heidegger puts it, the they prescribes one state of mind and determines what and how one sees. As a they-self, Dasein is tranquilized, uh, that's his word there, tranquilized, alienated, inauthentic, all the while believing, as he puts it, it is leading a full and genuine life. But, Countess Heidegger, it's not leading a full and genuine life. It is not true to its being. In society, Dasein is not itself. In society, design, Dasein is inauthentic. Heidegger says that this is not a moralizing critique. He, and I, he's saying that because being in the world with others, as he puts it, is a basic state of Dasein. It is not a moral choice made by us. Uh, to submit ourselves to the customary interpretation uh, of being offered by the they. 
uh, offered by the public world, uh, it is inevitable, uh, inexorable. As Heidegger puts it, Dasein falls, falls into this way of being in the, in, in the world, this way of social being, and falls away from itself as an authentic potentiality for being itself. And here I think we come to the existentialist moment that inspired uh, the likes of Sartre. Uh, because as Heidegger writes, Dasein exists. Because Dasein exists, it determines its own character as the kind of entity it is. And it does so in every case in terms of a possibility which it itself is and which it understands. Now, what allows Dasein, what allows the individual human being to free itself of the obfuscations and concealments of social existence. Um, what allows Dasein to seize hold of itself um, rather than let the one take hold of it, uh, make decisions for it, determine how one sees and thinks and so on. Uh, and the answer lies in this, in the answer lies in the individualizing force of anxiety, of angst. Uh, a mood, as Heidegger puts it, that strips the world of its socially prescribed uh, meaning, of its public interpretation, um, that strips the world of its appearance as something for us uh, to use. A mood that discloses the insignificance of the world, the meaninglessness of societal being. And in this mood, in anxiety, uh, which you know, sounds like a you know, terrifically unpleasant state, uh, uh, state uh, of mind to be in, in this mood, fueled by guilt and the call of conscience, Dasein is confronted with its own potentiality for being, he writes. And most importantly, its own not-to-be-outstripped ultimate potentiality, which is death. In that recognition, that moment of vision, as, as he puts it, when Dasein's own finitude, when our own finitude, uh, and Dasein's death... Um, sorry. In that moment of vision, when... Dasein's own finitude, Dasein's potentiality to be for itself and not for others becomes clear. Because being towards death, argues Heidegger, wrenches Dasein away from the, the, this they self, this kind of public world, this world uh, of the anonymous social mass, and discloses the freedom to be itself. It discloses the freedom for, da for Dasein to be authentic, to live an authentic life. Now, the key elements of Heidegger's thought are all in play in Being and Time. Uh, his critique of technological, instrumental reason, his critique of the in inauthentic nature of modern social existence, its alienating, deracinating effects, and the way in which mass democratic society conceals our true vocation uh, to think being, uh, to ask the question of being. That's also, um, that's also there in, um, in, in Being and Time. Um, I would say that the aspect that recedes um, in, in Heidegger's later work is what Jack Derrida called uh, Heidegger's massive voluntarism. Um, and that's this kind of existentialist vision of authentic uh, being, of living according to one's own choices rather than the choices of others. Um, that's the part that will be taken up and developed, I think, by French existentialism. Uh, the belief that if existence precedes essence, uh, then man is condemned to be free. But what is always there in Heidegger's work, in his, in, his, in his work after Being and Time, uh, what doesn't recede, I think, is Heidegger's critique of modernity, of its human-centeredness, human of its belief in man's ability to legislate and reason uh, for himself, of the tendency to see the world and use it in terms of human-centered ends. Um, we are caught up, as Max Weber put it, in an iron cage of rationality, in which, as Heidegger's contemporary and rival, Georg Lukács put it, man experiences his self-made environment as a prison instead of a home. Um, think of Heidegger's um, 1946 letter on humanism, uh, a letter which he sent to uh, a French man called Jean Bouffray, uh, and directed, if you like, at a French audience where Heidegger's stock uh, was still rising. Uh, you know, he, he was rather tainted in Germany by, the, by 1946. Um, and in this letter on humanism, he talks there of the homelessness of modern man and asserts that man is not the lord of beings, man is the shepherd of being. 
And I think what makes Heidegger so appealing to generations of post-war intellectuals, especially in France, especially on the left, is precisely his constant criticism of modernity. Uh, and that's because of the, as the kind of Stalinist turn um, on, of, of the French, of, of, sorry, of the Russian Revolution, as that made Marx harder to draw on for post-war French intellectuals, as the French Communist Party became a rather kind of sclerotic uh, Stalinist organisation. Uh, so Heidegger provided a resource to criticise the modern world that was not um, that was not Marxist. Uh, a chance to condemn, if you like, the economic exploitation of the world, uh, the mindlessness of consumer culture and the groundlessness of liberal democratic institutions without siding uh, with the communists. Now, no talk on Heidegger is probably complete without a bit about his Nazism. Um, I'd, I'd suggest in some ways Heidegger is, is probably most famous now for being a Nazi. Um, and equally, I don't think any, uh, any talk on Heidegger is complete without mentioning his anti-Semitism. Um, What's interesting, I think, about that both these two aspects is that neither were incidental, I don't think, to Heidegger's thoughts. Uh, you don't have his ontology, his critique of modernity over here, and then his kind of Nazism and his anti-Semitism over here. You know, they're, they're not separate uh, from one another. Um, in fact, Nazism and anti-Semitism are easily integrated into his thought. He makes them his own. Uh, so for Heidegger, National Socialism promises to resolve the problem of a valueless technological reasoning. Uh, in its kind of blood and soil rhetoric, it promises to reconnect man uh, with his lost home. Uh, this is where the inner truth and greatness of Nazism lies, in the global encounter with technology, as, uh, as Heidegger put it. Uh, and any disillusionment he felt towards Nazism, uh, which he certainly experienced after his short-lived rectorship at the uh, University of Freiburg, uh, was not because he thought there was a problem uh, with National Socialism as an idea, as a, as, as a kind of you know, something spiritual to be committed to. Uh, rather, it's because National Socialism didn't live up to its promise. It wasn't, in some ways, National Socialist enough. It was too enthralled as Heidegger put it, to the metaphysics of subjectivity. Uh, it wasn't sufficiently anti-modern. It was too enthrall uh, to the very modernity which Heidegger so ruthlessly criticised and he hoped National Socialism was going to solve uh, and answer. Likewise, uh, Heidegger's anti-Semitism, uh, as the recent publication of these so-called uh, black notebooks reveal, was not an incidental aspect uh, of his thinking. Again, it was integral to his thought. Um, for Heidegger, uh, Jews alongside Bolsheviks, uh, they, are, they are seen as the agents of modernity, uh, and as such, they are the harbingers of our destruction. Uh, the type of humanity, as he puts it, that has assumed the world's historical task of uprooting all beings from being. Uh, Jews, he continue, belong to the metaphysics of the West. Uh, they have helped to spread both empty rationality, as he puts it, and a capacity for calculation. And they are, in, they are intent on realising, as he puts it, a rootless, uh, homogenous, technological mass society. So, at the heart of the inauthentic world of the they, which we see presented in Being and Time, Heidegger puts the Jews, and he makes them integral, essential to his own thought, uh, along with the Bolsheviks, who he also doesn't like. Um, Heidegger's anti-Semitism, then, is almost at one with his anti-modernity. Uh, his critique of the modern world justified his loathing of the Jews. Uh, and when you realise that Heidegger identifies Jewry with everything that he loathes about the modern world, its rootlessness, its uh, instrumentalism, its technological thinking, it becomes clear that his shocking suggestion that the Jews actually brought the Holocaust on themselves makes perfect sense to Heidegger. When the systematic extermination, uh, extermination of Jewry is presented as the logical end point of humanity's rootless, technological, calculative trajectory, our destiny, as he puts it, then the Jews, the agents of a rootless, technological, calculative rationality, are indeed the architects of their own downfall. And I think, to conclude, it's worth remembering um, that Heidegger intended the Black Notebooks, um, which were written between 1931 and 1940, I think, uh, and they're known as the Black Notebooks because of the black uh, oil skin covers, not because of the contents, although they sound more sinister because they're known as the Black Notebooks. Um, he intended these to be published last, 
They, these were to be the last of his collected works. Um, and I think that shows that anti-Semitism and National Socialism, um, these were not aberrations for Heidegger. They weren't even sources of, of shame. He clearly experienced them as essential parts of that which sustains his appeal, uh, and that is his thoroughgoing critique of modernity. And that's where I'm going to leave this for now. Okay, no. Right. Any questions? Uh, yeah. Um, the I'm interested in this idea of kind of the person being, or the, the self somehow being inauthentic in a group, and in that sense, what sense it actually makes to denounce any particular group, and um, I guess particularly um, Jews and, and Bolsheviks here. When, when he also senses that contention between how we are and want to be in ourselves and how we are in groups. Okay. Um, I'd, I'd like to say that I'm quite a fan of your writing in Spiked, which is, I think the last, last thing you wrote about Oldham was quite, quite perceptive. Um, but I do disagree with your take on Heidegger because you mentioned Leo Strauss there. Um, if you read Leo Strauss, uh, The City and Man, he, he actually rejected Heidegger's approach. I'd like you to talk about that because my view is that Strauss concluded really that the authentic life is a life of the philosopher. And essentially my take on Heidegger is that he was not, uh, you know, he, he, he was against not only modernity, he was also against the ancients, and he was in fact a mystic. I don't know of men, anyone myself that takes on any uh, philosopher or political uh, theory, what is it, and takes on the whole lot, power of fashion. I don't know anyone that does that. Uh, I think, uh, well, just my comment is that um, from what I know, people um, interpret things and they pick out the bits that interest them. and. You know, it's it's no, not. I don't know any <coughs> taking on a political theory in para para style. Yeah, I'm just interested in. You, know, you mentioned about this. Um, I didn't mention of modernity. I mean, what does it mean by modernity? What sense of modernity? Why shouldn't we just, uh, I don't know, eject Heidegger from the canon? Um, oh, sorry. Uh, why? Yeah, the question as uh, to why we should continue to read someone like Martin Heidegger. Um, I think principally because. Um, as, this, as this lady pointed out, um, he has influenced and been important to so many other influential and important thinkers who didn't just simply parrot Heidegger, uh, but used him uh, in really interesting ways. Um, I don't think Sartre is possible without Heidegger, uh, but no one could accuse Sartre, I don't think, of being uh, a rabid uh, Nazi or anti-Semite. Um, and also, I think that... that there is plenty in Heidegger uh, that is actually um, fascinating. Um, and I think in, in its own right, you know, it deserves um, a degree, it, it deserves interrogation, um, certainly, um, but it still deserves and needs to be read. Um, the question of modernity, of what Heidegger means by modernity, uh, because it's Heidegger, uh, He's, he, 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 you know, he doesn't talk in terms of, of a political scientist. He doesn't really talk in very definite terms at all. Uh, for Heidegger, modernity he identifies with, I guess, two things, really. One, I think, is the metaphysics of subjectivity. Uh, that is, if you like, the, the, the overinvestment uh, post-enlightenment, I would say, in the idea of the human subject, of our ability to know the world uh, and order it according to our own ends uh, to, um, uh, to come up with a self-determining being, to imagine what self-determination is, uh, to come up with um, self-legitimating political structures. Um, I think for him, you know, Heidegger collapses all that into this idea of the metaphysics of subjectivity. Uh, he also um, thinks of modernity in terms of uh, this kind of notion of sort of technological or technical reasoning, uh, which I think is, 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 is best off being thought of in terms of um, a more uh, comprehensible idea of instrumental reason. Uh, that is, um, the uh, using things uh, for our 
ends, um, whatever those ends might be. Um, and Heidegger just has a problem with um, this whole framework of thinking. Um, so actually, you know, Heidegger won't talk particularly about modernity. He will talk about modern. He will talk about the modern homelessness of, of you talk about the homelessness of modern man. Uh, but, but these are very sort of large, broad ideas which almost sort of correspond with a sort of a mood of, of disillusionment with modern institutions, with, you know, in, in interwar Germany, with sort of liberal, uh, uh, well, incipient sort of liberal democratic uh, forms of, 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 of government. So Heidegger plays upon this intense mood of disillusionment with, I would, I would suggest, almost like liberal and in the background, liberal kind of capitalistic institutions. Um, and that's why he comes up, well, that's why I suspect he finds nationalist socialism quite so attractive, because it appears to be uh, an autocratic solution to what he considers to be this, uh, yeah, the problem with modernity. Um, oh, Leo Strauss. Yes, Leo, obviously Leo Strauss didn't sim simply power at Heidegger. I, I think I meant that Leo Strauss is, as you say, his, uh, the extent to which he invested such a great deal in the idea of the ideal of the of the philosopher of the thinker, which is it, it, it's one of Heidegger's sort of motifs. Certainly in his later years, when he, yeah, when he perhaps wants to sort of create himself as this sage, as this person who's committed to thinking, not coming up with solutions. He was just interested in the process of of thinking, of asking questions. Uh, and in that regard, yeah, I think you're probably right. I think there is a strong degree of uh, mysticism in, in Heidegger. I think there's a strong degree, th there's a strong influence, if you like, of a Catholic, uh, a Roman Catholic tradition of, of mysticism in Heidegger, which is a massive influence in Heidegger. I think it's, a, it's important not, not to underestimate the role of Catholicism and, and, uh, and religiosity in Heidegger's work. You know, his, his, his father was a sexton at, at a Roman Catholic church, and Heidegger, up until I think perhaps the age of sort of 1920, <laughs> he, was he, he was studying under Jesuits and in, in, in intent on becoming a priest. Um, so, yeah, it's a mixture of mysticism, but I think that's largely a kind of hangover from his perhaps prior religious convictions. Um, inauthenticity and, and group identity, and, and does that in some ways undercut, um, yeah, Heidegger's assault on Jews and, and, and Bolsheviks? Uh, n not really, uh, because for Heidegger, inauthenticity is, is, is indissociable from his critique of society and social being as, as a whole, including all those groups. He, he, he doesn't really think, he, do, he doesn't think in terms of either those, either religious identities or, or, or uh, political identities. He certainly doesn't think in terms of identity politics. For, for him, for Heidegger, he is thinking of inauthenticity solely in terms of this social uh, public being or role which individuals uh, adopt or play out. Um, and you, again, you can see the kind of uh, Sartrean development of that idea. Do you regard that as an original thought, though? Because I think that came from Kierkegaard quite a lot. Uh, of that. Is it an original thought? Um, There's a it's lot original, of it's, a, it's, a, it, yeah, it's, it's originally essential that it's an original thought. I mean, no ideas in philosophy ever are original thoughts. It's bashing up together ideas to come up with new ideas. So you need to do that. And every philosopher needs to do that. I think Parmenides would disagree with that. <laughs> Is it an original thought? Um, well, uh, the gentleman behind you uh, answered that question uh, very eloquently. Um, I've, I'm, sure, I'm sure I've missed some questions here, but I should let other people talk. Well, sure, we can come back to them. We've got plenty of time anyway. So, uh, more questions? More comments? Go on. Um, I'm interested, because um, I think there's one thing that you kind of missed out from your whole talk, is Heidegger's idea of kind of truth, which I think comes out in a lot of the various things that he talks about. Um, and his idea of being and the kind of the wider notion of being as the background understanding of the world that we share and how we've gone through phases of that. Um, and he kind of, he talks he uses a lot of polysemy where he uses meaning words intentionally where they have multiple meanings. Um, and he uses the idea of rep repetition where you see examples of an idea repeated again and again, but the meanings are kind of shifted. So it kind of relates to what I was talking about, how he might have used an, idea, an unoriginal idea, but he reframes it in a new context. Um, and his whole idea of the earth versus the world where the, the, the totality of everything is beyond a way that we can explicate completely with language. 
so there's always going to be gaps. So you bring it together in a world which is an approximation, which you, is the way you currently understand the totality of everything. Um, and I was wondering if you could fit that in with everything you've kind of talked about. Yeah, again, um, kind of with the, the earlier question of, of kind of what is modernity, I think it's, it's quite interesting in a way to sort of look at the, the kind of Nazi anti-modernism, which was actually quite modernist in many ways itself. And when there's always, I've always felt there's an inherent um, kind of interaction between modernism and anti-modernism <coughs> that the two only really exist in relation to each other. Um, just wonder what your, your thoughts on that and what I think would have made. Okay. Just because we're competing with the forces of nature, just if you can so, make sure you speak into the mic. Cheers. Christ. <laughs> uh, well, the <laughs> I'll admit, I think the uh, Heidegger's idea of truth, I, to be honest, I find it a really difficult question. I'm struggling to know how to answer that. Um, I do think you have drawn something, uh, drawn uh, attention to something which is really important in terms of Heidegger, which is uh, not just his use of language, not just his, um, the self consciousness with which he uses. Um, language, uh, but as far as he's concerned, almost it's indissociability uh, from thought and, 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 and thinking. Um, so as you say, he's, he's constantly playing with meanings. Uh, certain words, everyday words, uh, almost acquire this kind of um, luminous or something as, as he plays with them. Like, even the word being is, and, and the, um, to be, the verb, is, is being played with all the time, and I, I, as I said in my introduction, it, it's, it's mesmerising. Um, what I do worry, though, is, is that in some ways, certainly with his idea of truth, if, if he opens up, I know he has this kind of background understand, this shared background of being, which sort of underpins or uh, is the condition for all utterances or all utterings, um, but I always wonder if it, it, it is opening the way for what we now experience in, in, in modern life as, as relativism. I always think that that is there in in Heidegger, and certainly his, his, his attention to and his use of language. Um, the Jewish thinker's question, uh, and actually not the Jewish, the, the Heidegger's provincialism, uh, which relates back to uh, Heidegger's inability to ascend to, this, to, to the high ranks of these almost semi-philosopher kings uh, that you mentioned, uh, who, who almost see something esoteric about philosophical knowledge, which is only open to, 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 the, to the few. Um, yeah, Heidegger did always seem to sort of uh, reject or uh, refuse to let himself get taken up into the, in, in, into the highest ranks. He always seemed to have this kind of uh, affected unpretentiousness. He wanted to be, remain close to the soil, if you like. So he always, you know, he dressed as a peasant, even though his parents uh, weren't dressing as pants, even though as a child he didn't dress as a peasant. He had this uh, ridiculous sort of uh, Bavarian uh, dress code, uh, which he's, you know, he, he's strolling around these rather sort of cosmopolitan uh, university campuses dressed as a, as a Bavarian peasant. And he spends most of his time when he's writing locked away in, 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 this, in, in this hut in the woods. Um, so I, he definitely played up his provincialism. He saw it as a source of truth as a, a, yeah, a source of truth because it disclosed to him something very particular about being there. Um, Heidegger was very much being there in, 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 a, in a rural, um, perhaps even backward uh, community. And he always turned that into a virtue, I think, at points. Um, and it's one reason why you know, I can't imagine Heidegger ever mixing uh, with uh, those other uh, figures you mentioned. Um, I'm sure I, I can never, I'm trying to find the source of this anecdote, uh, but Georg Zimmel, uh, the sociologist, used to run these rather sort of fashionable soirees uh, where the likes of Max Weber would be there, uh, Georg Lukash, who some of you may know. Uh, and I think Heidegger turned up there one time, you know, dressed as a peasant uh, and speaking with a particularly funny accent. And he was kind of, he wasn't treated as the sage which his students treated him. He, he, was, he was laughed at, he was laughed out. Uh, so Heidegger had a kind of problematic, perhaps troubled relationship uh, with um, 
for want of a better phrase, a kind of philosophical or cultural elite. Um, he, he, had just, he had an affair with a Jewish lady. Not Hannah Arendt. Yeah, yeah, you mentioned that, didn't you? But yeah, she yeah. rehabilitated him, him as well after the war. She was she one of his main advocates. She did. Interesting. Well, yes, she did. Yeah. Uh, interesting. So she obviously saw the value as a Jewish person in whatever it was. <laughs> You know, but it helped, as I, as I mentioned in my introduction, that, that Heidegger turns anti-Semitism from, you know, uh, you know, he, he doesn't go along with the kind of the, the, the Nazi kind of biological uh, racism. Uh, he turns um, the Semite into a kind of spiritual embodiment. You know, he kind of de-biologizes it, it, if you like. You know, his, his, his racism or his, and his, his anti-Semitism uh, acquires this weird metaphysical quality, uh, which is one reason I think Hannah Arendt can almost suggest that Heidegger w just had his head in the clouds when he became a, became a Nazi. I think she misses the point that Heidegger's Nazism was always in the clouds. Uh, that's where it had to be for him if it was going to be effective. He got fed up with Nazism because it wasn't spiritual enough. Um, the play of anti-modern and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to answer that right now. I think that's a, that is a fascinating question. That's what I will say. Okay. Right. Oh, oh yeah, keep going. I'll respond to yours. Oh, yeah. No, no, you keep going. <laughs> Take them back. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions before response to Mark? I've just got something about this, uh, this trouble he has with authenticity. And when you tell me about this person who was playing a role and playing a game and that inauthenticity, if you like, that he's adopted in my mind. And I think he's... It's almost like we come into this world fully formed and we don't. We have interdependency in terms of our relationships with others. And without the social world and without social others, there wouldn't be such thing as being or existence. My reading of Heidegger isn't that he's kind of an anarchist individualist or that he's like totalitarian, you need to be part of society. It's somewhere in the middle and as a kind of adjunct to that kind of view, because I do think he places value on you and um, getting your understanding of the world in relation to other people, so, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, Heidegger is not a... He doesn't think we're... He doesn't think we exist alone. That we um, can, uh, that we are self-sufficient individuals. He, he, his argument is that being in the world is the basic state of our, of our being, uh, but being with others is also a basic state of our being, and that we develop our understanding of, of the world, both through our dealings with the world, the way in which we use things around us, you know, it could just be me talking into a microphone, I'll start to experience the microphone as having this type of meaning, um, but also uh, through, his, through one's dealings with others. He thinks you can't you can't. You, you will always end up understanding the world in terms of your dealings with it and your dealings with other people through other people, right? The revelation for Heidegger, not the revelation, but there was a revelatory point um, where this being with others, as he as he puts it, leads to a a fallenness, a falling into being with others. I know it sounds terribly abstract. But he, he means that people, you can't help, because you are existing in a world with other people, uh, in existing in a social world, you can't help but um, acquire the thoughts, the pre-existing thoughts, you know, the, 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 uh, the whole, you know, you, you can't help but encounter the world the way in which, uh, you can't help but encounter a world which history uh, and, and, and the, the social achievement which that, that involves, uh, you can't help but encounter the world that that history is bequeathed to you. But Heidegger reckons that you can also... Um, oh Christ. I might start this again, actually. <laughs> <laughs> what do I mean? What do I mean? What does Heidegger mean? Who knows? That's the big question of Heidegger. Is he saying no. you can have thought without the other? Is he saying that that somehow exists? The thought without the you other. Can, uh, th there's something that is a... Uh, isn't know. it a bit banal? Because uh, the fact we exist in the world something. isn't just stating the banal truth. I mean, it's not revelatory to say... No, that no, no that's not revelatory. That's not revelatory. Uh, the, 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 the revelatory bit, the, the point at which Heidegger inspires something like existentialism, the, the Sartrean version of 
existentialism is the point at which he thinks that that's a, that's a problem. Uh, the point at which he thinks that uh, living uh, in society, uh, uh, th you know, thinking received thoughts, thinking uh, and, and playing roles which are ascribed to one, uh, that, that, that that is the mark of so inauthenticity. The what is the alternative? Uh, he, he, he doesn't... <laughs> Authentic existence, uh, which you describe as something. Like no, well, it's, that, that was his choice. That was his choice. But it, it, it's opening up um, a space in which uh, you can choose choose for yourself how to be. That seems to be, in 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 essence, what he wants to argue. Um, it's recognizing that you 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 have to take responsibility for your own life because your own, it is your own life and no others. Uh, death, this is where death plays its role um, because he says death is inalienable. You can't take death away. Uh, death will not be taken away from you. You are being <coughs> towards death. You have to recognise that your life is uh, finite, that it has an end, and you have to take responsibility for it. Um, that's... In short, it seems to be what he's saying, um, and it does prove, it, it, you know, it, it does prove to be a kind of groundswell, uh, uh, sorry, a wellspring for uh, existentialist um, philosophy and thought, um, and it's as it's as valuable as, as as you deem existentialist thought to be to be valuable. Um, um, I think it's interesting you mentioned the uh, hippie aspect. To Heidegger, because um, because weird, weirdly enough, you know, Heidegger's thought, uh, whether it influenced uh, the counterculture in a direct way, uh, is, is doubtful. Um, but you can hear Heidegger in in kind of you know kind of countercultural sort of uh, beatnik pronouncements. You know, this idea of being oneself, being true to yourself. You know, th that 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 element, that kind of strain of thought is, 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 is there in Heidegger. I always think that Heidegger almost provides you with a, with a kind of ethics of, of reality TV, where on reality TV, the, the worst thing you can be in re on reality TV, Big Brother, whatever, whichever one, is two-faced. The worst thing you can be is hypocritical, you know, pretend to be one thing and then saying something behind someone's back. Uh, so everyone on reality TV always says, oh, you know, I always, I always speak my mind, I'm, all, I'm always being myself, I'm always being, and in fact, I'm always being authentic. Um, so I think that, that kind of kind of countercultural language or countercultural ethos um, is, is a good way into Heidegger, uh, as well as something that almost can be uh, that comes out of Heidegger. I, whether it's introspective or not, is it, 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 yes, it, it, it's it's passive. It's it's about cultivating oneself in in the kind of hippie uh, hippieish sense. So yes, it it, it isn't particularly uh, it's certainly not revolutionary. Um, what I was going to say uh, the. The telos, is there a telos in Heidegger's thought? Um, he certainly talks about, you know, he uses phrases like an, an, an equipped mental totality, you know, this kind of totality of, of, of tools. Uh, he talks about, as I mentioned in my introduction, uh, he talks about nature having a certain direction which we encounter in, 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 in the various in various signs, in, in, in streets, in, in, in canals, and so on. You know, we've given it a certain direction. The ends, he never states what, what they are. Um, there'll have been the particular ends uh, which whoever decided a canal should be built or a street should, should be built uh, wanted, wanted to be met. He, so there are these kind of localised uh, teloses, but you know, Heidegger doesn't sort of map, map them out. Uh, he's keen, you know. He, he's just describing that. Um, he's just uh, he's just describing that. He's just saying that social existence is organised and ordered in in a certain way, and there are ends for which it is for which it is ordered. Um, and ultimately, he wants to say that those ends are not your ends. They're not ends which you have you have chosen. That so he's not concerned with what the ends are. He just wants to uh, draw attention to the fact that these are not things which you have chosen for yourself. You have to choose your own end. You have to be, yeah, this is this kind of notion of sort of an authentic individualism. Um, the dialectic of enlightenment, uh, it's, it, the Frankfurt School's relationship with Heidegger is, is 
fascinating. Like I mentioned, Herbert Marcuse, who was a student of Heidegger, uh, and they had a very, very close relationship and one that was obviously problematized uh, by Heidegger's involvement with the Nazis. Uh, Adorno and Horkheimer didn't have that close relationship uh, with Heidegger, but I think there's a, there a great deal of similarity uh, in their critiques of uh, modernity, in, in that both see the, see the problem uh, with the modern world uh, in terms of, in terms of yeah, instrumental technological reason, or rather the, the, the degeneration or the inevitable degeneration of enlightenment reason. Uh, hence, you know, the dialect of enlightenment you know, wants to suggest that sort of mass barbarism is the result of the, you know, man's sort of hubris, of, of, of man's ex, uh, excessive faith in reason and rationality. Um, and Heidegger plays, plays the same game, plays the same game. This is why he'll talk eventually. Uh, he will liken the, cry. He will liken, <laughs> he will liken the Holocaust to uh, uh, motorized uh, food industry. Uh, it, it's, they're, they're, of the, they're of the same, um, they have the same quality. They're both a product of, of, of man's increasing technological mastery of the world, uh, which is both rational and ultimately irrational. That's what he wants to say. I took this out of Ken and Malik's book, Meaning of Race, where Heidegger in 1949 talked about, and you hear this so often today, but it, it kind of the animal rights thing, where agriculture is now a mechanical food industry. In essence, it is no different from the production of corpses in the gas chambers and death camps. So you hear people talking about, you know, factory farming being like the Holocaust and therefore reducing the Holocaust to, you know, uh, raising chickens, all that kind of stuff. So, anyway, go on. Could, could you make some comments about uh, his his interest in poetry, perhaps? Uh, because I think that's yeah. a, another strong part of his uh, critique. Any final points? And then, if you want to come back with an answer, and also any kind of summing up and rounding up that you want to do as well. Go on. Well, I'm just thinking, how does his positivity or authenticity? Relate to support for national socialism because some of Reagan's speeches, um, which were supportive of national socialism, were all about uh, service, uh, community, responsibility. It sounds a bit like New Labour, you can't quite share Community would be great. Um, how do these two things relate? Okay. Right. Um, I can't say too much about uh, Heidegger's uh, attitude, sorry, uh, Heidegger's relationship to poetry. Um, largely because I find some of his writings on poetry almost uh, unreadable. Um, but what, what I would say is that he, he esteems poetry or esteems um, a kind of more symbolic language uh, to the extent to which um, he wants to reject any instrumental use of language. Uh, language that might want to do things or urge people to do things. Uh, in fact, even sort of traditional philosoph philosophical language, you know, that as Heidegger's career develops, he moves further and further away, even from the kind of uh, the esoteric but still technical language of, of being in time. You know, he, he aspires, his writing aspires, I think, to the status of, of poetry and that it's almost meant to be inconsequential, that it's not meant to have an end or realise something in the world, let alone answer big questions. Uh, so I think, yeah, that's how I would, that, that's how I think his interest in poetry is, is, is really interesting. <laughs> um, authenticity in the National Socialists. <coughs> I need to think about that question, actually. That's what I'll say about that. <laughs> okay. Is that it? I, 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 I think so. Okay. Thank you very much.